Good evening. This is evening prayer for Thursday, October the 8th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 10. And Jesus called to him the twelve disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Our book of Concord reading this evening is the beginning of Article 12 on repentance. Again, these next two articles are long. We're going to take them uh, just about three columns of text a night, so it's not too much to listen to. Uh, so we'll be beginning Article 12, uh, paragraphs 1 through 14 this evening. In Article 12, the adversaries approve of the first part, in which we present this, those who have fallen after baptism may obtain the forgiveness of sins whenever and as often as they are converted. 
They condemn the second part, in which we say that the parts of repentance are contrition and faith. They deny that faith is the second part of repentance. O Charles, most invincible emperor, what should we do? This is the very voice of the gospel. Through faith we obtain the forgiveness of sins. These writers of the confutation condemn this voice of the gospel. Therefore we can in no way agree to the confutation. We cannot condemn the voice of the gospel. It is beneficial and full of comfort. What else is the denial that we obtain the forgiveness of sins by faith than contempt for Christ's blood and death? We beg you, O Charles, most unconquerable emperor, patiently and diligently, hear and examine this most important subject. It contains the chief topic of the gospel, the true knowledge of Christ and the true worship of God. For all good people will determine that, especially on this subject, we have taught things that are true, godly, beneficial, and necessary for Christ's whole church. All good people will determine from the writings of our theologians that very much light has been added to the gospel, and many deadly errors have been corrected. By these errors, through the opinions of the scholastics and canonists, the doctrine of repentance was previously covered up. Before we defend our position, we must first say this. All good people of all situations, even the theological profession, undoubtedly confess that the teaching of repentance was very much confused before Luther's writings appeared. Theologians were never able to explain satisfactorily the numberless questions found in the books of the commentaries on the sentences. The people could not grasp the big picture, nor could they see what things were necessary for repentance. We'll just make a quick side comment there. This book uh, called The Sentences, those would be the sentences of Peter Lombard, and it was a uh, theological work, basically like a book of dogma, kind of like how Lutherans have uh, Peeper. And this book of the sentences was often what these theologians studied over and over and read all these commentaries about it, uh, instead of actually, you know, reading the Bible. Uh, so they just talked about this book nonstop. In fact, uh, the guys at our seminary can actually take a course on it uh, to see what it was all about. So it was a very important work at the time, but as the confessors are pointing out, when you only study that and not scripture, it covers up a lot of the simplicity of the doctrine that God has revealed to us. So moving on. The people could not grasp the big picture, nor could they see what things were necessary for repentance in which peace of conscience could be found. Let any one of the adversaries come forth and tell us when the forgiveness of sins takes place. O oh, good God, there is such darkness. The adversaries do not know whether the forgiveness of sins happens in attrition or contrition. If forgiveness happens because of contrition, why do we need absolution? What does the power of the keys bring about if sins have been forgiven already? Here they work even harder and wickedly divert from the power of the keys. Some imagine that guilt is not forgiven by the power of the keys, but that eternal punishments are changed into temporal ones. So the most beneficial power would be the service, not of life and the spirit, but only of God's anger and punishments. The more cautious imagine that sins are forgiven before the church and not before God by the power of the keys. This is also a deadly error, for if the power of the keys does not comfort us before God, what will quiet the conscience? What follows is even more involved. The adversaries teach that we merit grace by contrition. In reference to this, if anyone should ask why Saul, Judas, and similar persons, who were dreadfully contrite, did not receive grace, here is the answer. We take it from faith and according to the gospel that Judas did not believe. He did not support himself by the gospel and Christ's promise. For faith shows the distinction between the contrition of Judas, Matthew 27, 3-5, and of Peter, Matthew 26, 75. But the adversaries take their answer from the law, that Judas did not love God, but feared the punishments. When will a terrified conscience be able to decide whether it fears God for his own sake, or is fleeing from eternal punishments? The Psalms and the prophets describe those serious, true, and great terrors which the truly converted experience. Such great emotions can be distinguished in letters and terms, but they are not separated in fact, as these dear philosophers imagine. Here we appeal to the judgments of all good and wise people. 
Undoubtedly, they will confess that these discussions in the writings of the adversaries are very confused and intricate. Still, the most important subject is at stake, the chief topic of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. In the writings of the adversaries, this entire doctrine about these questions is full of errors and hypocrisy and clouds over Christ's benefit, the power of the keys, and the righteousness of faith. These things happen in the first act of this play. What about confession? What a work there is in the endless listing of sins. Nevertheless, this is in great part devoted to sins against human traditions. So that good minds may be more tortured by this, the adversaries falsely assert that this listing is of divine right. They demand this listing under the claim of divine right. In the meantime, they speak coldly about absolution, which is truly of divine right. They falsely assert that the sacrament itself bestows grace by the mere performance of one act, ex opere operato, without a good disposition on the part of the one using it. They do not mention faith grasping the absolution and comforting the conscience. This is truly what is generally called departing before the mysteries. The third act of this play concerning satisfaction remains. It contains the most confused discussions. The adversaries imagine that eternal punishments are switched to the punishments of purgatory, and teach that a part of them is forgiven by the power of the keys, and that a part is to be redeemed by means of satisfactions. Further, they add that satisfactions should be extraordinary works, supererogation. They make these consist of the most foolish observances, such as pilgrimages, rosaries, or similar observances that do not have God's command. And if you think that's confusing, we will talk about more of all these different parts of what they thought repentance meant because man had to stick his two cents in and make it far more complicated than it actually is. And you'd wonder, is it any wonder that people in the Middle Ages were terrified of God and thought that he was only the angry judge? Uh, when, when you believe that that is how the process you have to go through to confess your sins, it's no wonder that people were absolutely horrified by God. So we'll be paying attention to this in great detail uh, for the next, oh, probably about a week and a half, we'll be on these two topics. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. 
O eternal high priest, let the fruit of your spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another, to the glory of your holy name, here in time, and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.